So uh, I'm very thankful for you to, to be here and with us today. So um, my name is uh, Margot Larperez, and uh, so I'm a doctor in cognitive psychology. So I understand the struggle of everything we're going to talk about today. And I work as an open science trainer at the Université Paris Cité, which is in Paris, France. Um, and uh, the, I work for the university libraries. And um, so just to give you um, a little bit of a context. So the university uh, I work in uh, part of the Circle U Alliance is a public research university, uh, which is called an experimental establishment. And it's the merger between um, two older universities, which were Paris Diderot and Paris Descartes. And we're, we have approximately 62,000 uh, students and 3,500 3, graduate students. And here is a picture of our historical headquarters where I actually work. Um, I just forgot to tell you that if you have questions, please use the chat and uh, I will come back to you uh, along the presentation. So uh, if you could answer that question, I would like to know which university you're from. Uh, I listed the university from the Circle U Alliance, but if you are not part of these universities, you have a, a possibility to say that you're coming from, from another uh, uh, institution. Okay. Are oh, you from everywhere? That's great. A lot of people from Pisa and Belgrade. Um, Oslo, some people from Paris as well. <laughs> Tara, I send the link so you can uh, go to the voting to the poll, actually. OK. So a lot of you from Belgrade and Pisa. OK. I'm just going to ask you now if you're master student, PhD students, postdoc, if you're tenured, congratulations. Or if you are a librarian or someone else. <laughs> and you can just be there because you're curious and that's totally fine. <laughs> okay, a lot of PhD students, a few postdoc, someone in that administrative roles. Okay. Okay, well, I hope you're going to uh, learn some things today. Uh, I obviously the things are going to be different depending on the discipline you're working in. Um, so if you could just tell me um, in which discipline you're working very like, broadly, don't I mean, uh, okay. That's a lot of different things. Uh, linguistics, tourism, archaeology, microelectronics, history, linguistics. Okay. Artificial intelligence, diabetes research. Oh, I see a lot of linguists. <laughs> um, okay, well, that's awesome that you're all coming from very different disciplines. Um, I think it's pretty, pretty great. Um, and that also shows that open science related topics are um, of interest for everyone. So that's awesome. Okay, so I'm going to uh, move on and tell you what you are going to uh, learn, I hope, or just see again today. So we're going. To, I'm just going to tell you a few words about open science because uh, what we're going to talk today um, is part of a much broader discussion on open science. And we're going to uh, look a little bit um, back to the history of open access and where we're at today because 
um, that's pretty much uh, what the title um, was talking about. And we are also going to look at kind of like the um, the darker side of the open access ecosystem, uh, which is going to be an overview of predatory publishing. Um, so a few words on open science. Um, open science, if you are not already familiar with what it entails, uh, is the practice of science uh, in such a way that others can collaborate and contribute where research data, lab notes, and other research processes are freely available under terms that enable reuse, redistribution, and reproduction of the research and its underlying debt, data and methods. So the goal of open science is to have a, wi um, a wide um, opening of research processes, uh um be um if even if it's i mean data or papers um anything about the processes about uh code software and in a way that is not only free but that also enable the reuse and redistribution and collaboration and that's an important part of the open science uh, spirit um in france we have um a plan for open science that has been um decided at the ministry minister uh, level and that is a, a kind of um, guide for a, a French institution that and they describe open science pretty much the same way as an unhindered dissemination of results, methods and projects from scientific research. And um, it emphasized the fact that um, the opportunity for this um, uh, spread of um, of uh, open science uh, is dependent on the digital processes, but the digital progress to develop uh, open access to publication and to data and source code and research methods. And that's important because we're going to see how actually, obviously, uh, digital progress, the internet, the development of the personal computer um, have as a great role to, to play in, um, in the development of open access knowledge. So, and just to give you an idea of what open science is about, open science so basically is, um, a, um, it's um, a possible way to do your science, but it applies to any scientific process. So obviously there's an open side of uh, the access to publication, but it's also true of data, uh, science evaluation with uh, alternative open metrics. Um, open tools, open software. So yes, ev pretty much every uh, part of the scientific process has an open um, side, uh, if you are interested in, in open science. So just to um, make that, uh, so to make, make a long story short, it's a worldwide movement for knowledge dissemination. And it includes a lot of different activities from publishing to software development, citizen science as well. And it's beneficial um, for society and for you as a young researcher. And we are going, obviously, to talk about things that, I mean, you will see the benefits uh, for you, I hope. Um, so we are going to talk now about open access and go back in time to look a little bit about the history of open access. Why did we actually uh, need open access at some point? uh why did that emerge as in as a need in research and um where we are today uh, especially at the turn of the decade and uh the last decade has been eventful and especially with the rise of uh, the open processing charges uh model of academic publishing and we will talk about that and we'll see where it's going and what the future may hold in terms of sustainable open access um so if you're not familiar with uh the publishing system i guess some of you may already have uh, published already but some of you may not um the traditional publishing system is uh, working in a pretty peculiar way uh compared to a lot of different industries uh and you will see how it works i mean why i'm saying that very quickly um so in the traditional publishing system the author so it's you. <laughs> uh, you have an article to publish, and so you're sending it to um, editor, a scientific publisher, and um, for so you are giving the content of your research to a publisher. So you're sending a paper with everything you've done, etc. 
and we are not going to talk about the peer review. Let's say you're accepted, congratulations, and um, you are going to be published in a journal. And so um, the paper is published, and uh, then if other people, let's say students or researchers want to read your paper, they have to uh, actually um, pay to access the either the paper uh, or pay a subscription to the journal. And the way it works usually is that the library in the university where you work or study has um, a, a subscription to the journal or not, which allows you to actually read the paper. And when I say that it's a peculiar uh, market and a traditional uh, a system, um, publishing system here is that um, the reader, which when, so when I mean the reader, either another scientist or a student or you actually, you are the same person as the author. So it's a pretty much um, circular uh, graph here, meaning that the reader is very often going to be the author. And so the same person that is going to publish is the same person that is going to need to read. So the money is often going to come pretty much from the same source, uh, meaning the university, whether uh, from the research money, because that was used to actually make the research that end up in the journal or money for the subscription. So yes, so that's pretty much how it works. And you may think, well, that's okay. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, there may be some problems with that. And uh, you will be right in the sense that, I mean, it's not a new, uh, a new thing. And probably some of you were not born or just uh, toddlers when this paper, for example, that pretty much uh, summarized the issue has been published in 1998. Um, this was already a, 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 an issue in uh, the 1990s. And here you have pretty much a summary in this article from the New York Times of um, the problem that it, 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 um, in publishing. Um, quote, in fact, researchers says academia is a paradise for publishers. First, the public pays for most scientific research through, for example, the National Science Foundation, which is an American funder. Then universities pay the salaries of scientists who do virtually all the writing, reviewing, and editing. Universities sometimes even provide free office space to journals. Finally, authors typically sign over their copyrights to publishers who can sometimes bring in many millions of dollars a year in subscriptions for a single high price journal, subscription paid by university libraries, supported by tax dollars and tuition. So I hope you understand now the circular things I was talking about. So just to, uh, so to make a long story short, a lot of people thought that um, this will be uh, solved by the arrival of um, the internet and the personal computer uh, in the sense that the, the need to rely on, uh, on traditional infrastructure for publishing distributions was going to not be necessary anymore. Like anybody could be able to actually have a journal, um, a server and actually publish its own journal if it was going to be only on the internet. However, it's not really what happened. And actually the digital uh, progress that we had in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and um, the arrival of the personal computer coincided with the consolidation of the market around a few powerful actors, meaning that um, you had less and less publishers and they kind of became bigger and took more market shares. And they, use that also to actually uh, hike up the prices because there were less um, there were less people and so less companies and so they could uh, make the prices uh, higher and one of the rational to uh, increase subscription was that they had actually costs related to the technology that they didn't have before um, and it's a market that is um, actually pretty inelastic meaning that um, the I don't want to say things that may uh, um, um, make, make economists here uh, unhappy, but it's an inelastic demand, meaning that um, um, you cannot just go to another journal to get 
uh, the same article that you may have in like journal A, you're not going to have the same journal B, like things cannot be replaced. So you have very few possibilities in terms of like what you can actually consume. And you also had, so very competitive market, uh, uh, just a few companies uh, on the market and the start of what we call bundling practices, meaning that um, um, subscription were no but in bulk. Uh, the publishers would not let you buy subscriptions just for one journal, but ask you to buy for several journals at the same time, even if you actually don't want the other journals. And we ended up with a price explosion and an increase in publishers revenue um, in the last 30 years, basically. So here, what you see on your right is basically the inflation in the green, um, green blue line and the prices uh, associated with um, journal subscription in red. So they increased far much, much faster than inflation. And from um, basically the mid 1980s. So uh, you have pretty much now uh, five big companies in academic publishing. Sometimes it's called the big four because the last one is omitted. It depends, but so the big companies are Elsevier, Springer Nature, Wiley, Taylor and Francis, and the American Chemical Society. Uh, in some, um, in act actually in some fields, it represents uh, the vast majority of journals uh, in on the market. For example, so you see in chemistry and psychology, the percentage of articles that come from a journal that uh, is owned by one of the um, big five is more than 70%. And in terms of market share, um, in terms of publications, 25% of publications in the world are currently um, made on a journal that is owned by Elsevier, uh, but it's representing much more in terms of costs than just 25%. But so obviously in arts and humanities, it's less the case, but in some disciplines, it's very hard to uh, publish anywhere else than in one of these big five companies. Um, around 20, 10, around, I mean, almost 10 years ago, there's been a um, uh, new visibility of these issues that were kind of um, confided to libraries and research libraries and uh, labs. And, um, but it kind of made its way into the public discourse and domain in the sense that uh, uni Harvard University said that it could not afford uh, journal publisher prices anymore. Uh, and as you probably guess, if Harvard cannot afford something, nobody can. Um, the, the symbol is, is big here because uh, it really means that something about the subscription prices and their increase over time. Uh, and given that Elsevier was and is still uh, the biggest company on the market, um, a lot of the actions that were taken um, to actually try to decrease the prices of final alternatives um, were around boycotting Elsevier or having actions against Elsevier. Um, to give you just a, one of the exa an, an example of an initiative, you had the cost of knowledge, what well, was a petition that was signed by researchers, around, uh, almost 20,000 researchers that were saying that as long as the subscription price will not go down, um, they will not do any editorial work or publishing with Elsevier. And around that time, that's also when um, initiatives that are called uh, Black Open Access uh, really took off, um, same in the public. I mean, it was talked about a bit more, um, especially with the launch of sci at the end of 2011, and um, the Aaron Schwartz litigation in the United States regarding the downloading of uh, GStore uh, library through uh, MIT. Uh, so these issues also that were kind of circumventing the law to uh, allow people to access uh, the scientific literature um, contributed to um, this uh, movement towards more open access, more immediate open access. And in the same time, because it's also actually a digital era movement, as I was saying, you don't need uh, the traditional infrastructure, you just need a computer and a server. A lot of initiatives um, popped up online uh, to try to uh, make room for 
uh, alternative to uh, big publishers. And that's how actually some repositories um, started, for example, Archive, which is actually much older than we may think. <laughs> sometimes that uh, archive is more than 30 years old. Um, AL in France, uh, that is pretty much the same. I mean, it's an open archive for all disciplines and that started in 2001. And that's also how mega journals, uh, native open access journals um, were born. And I'm um, thinking of, uh, for example, Plus One in 2006, that was the first peer review open access mega journal. And when I say native open access, it means that um, this is a journal that never had any subscription um, option. So that's a journal that is only open access from the very beginning. And uh, I will explain to you the differences between uh, different type of open access right now. So you will not be lost, but it was just to tell you how all these things kind of developed in the same time and uh, how it's uh, shaped the, the, that the field, the open science, like, domain that ecosystem that we have today uh, so um just to give you an idea of where we are today uh, i would say that there are pretty much four different type of open access um today in the ecosystem and what we what i was showing you is the circularity uh, of uh, the, the traditional publishing uh, system. The system was called a, readers, a reader pays um, system because it was through subscription that the model was working, meaning that you had to pay to read, okay? Uh, now we're more uh, in an author pays model of academic publishing, meaning that with open access, so meaning that we don't need to read, uh, to pay to read, um, there was a need to find another way to actually make the system economically viable. And that's how we're introduced what we're going to call APCs, so of, um, article processing charges, meaning that instead of making the reader pay, we are going to make the author pay because we need to make a way to, I mean, to make this uh, journal exist without making people pay to read. And so, we kind of shift. Now we're in this model much more, um, and we're going to see how it actually influenced in the industry. So basically now you have gold OA, gold uh, OA open access, um, which is pretty much um, plus one or all the pluses, um, uh, a lot of journals that you will think about when you think about open access. So meaning that all the articles and related content are available for free immediately on the journal website. There's no subscription option. The publisher does charge you for an APC, meaning that the author actually pays for the paper to be available online for free. And this publishing publication costs, I just give you that because that's gonna be important after are paid by the researcher or I mean, his or her research institution or, a fund, or the funder. Um, we also have diamond open access, uh, which is uh, a model in which all the articles and related content are available for free immediately on the journal website, but the publisher does not charge author for a publishing fee. In this model, I mean, nobody, I mean, not the reader and the author, but they don't pay, none of them, but someone pays, obviously, but uh, it's you can guess a non-profit form of, of, of open access publishing. And in this case, these publications are internalized by non-commercial organization, association network, or public institution. So it's going to be things like university presses or uni university-based um, uh, scientific publications and stuff like that. Um, you also have hybrid OA, which is um, going to be the way the um, former traditional system kind of evolved uh, very often um, in the sense that article and related content will be behind a paywall and available through a subscription. So the, until now, we're still in the um, former model. But if you want, you can pay an option for the article to be for free and not behind a paywall. Um, but in this case, you have to pay for an APC. And we are going to see how a certain number of institutions are not funding this type of OA uh, for reasons that 
pretty much makes sense if you think about the economic model of this kind of publishing. And uh, there's also a last one called Greenaway, in which the article and related contents are available for free on a, a repository, which is a website, a server where things can be archived for good. And IPC may have been paid depending on whether the article was published by a traditional publisher before or not. But if it's not the case, it means that you put a preprint and that's the only way you actually publish the article by putting a preprint on the repository and not uh, by submitting it to an actual, I mean, an actual a traditional publisher. And this hosting is free of charge. I know that this is a lot of information uh, but I hope with example, with examples and uh, with the discussion, it's going to be uh, clearer for you. But I understand if it's a lot of information, it's not an easy, an easy topic and we'll have time for questions. Um, so um, I, I was saying that hybrid journals may not be um, reimbursed, like the costs will not be paid by the institutions because obviously um, there's something called double dipping in this type of economic model, meaning that actually these companies make money both on the subscription side and on the APC side, meaning that they can actually charge the same institution twice uh, for the same journal. And so uh, notably the plan S, which is um, which is part of the I mean, the plan uh, made in direction by the coalition S, which is um, European group of um, scientific funders, uh, including the European Commission, um, they have decided together that people, I mean, funders that are part of this coalition will not uh, support the hybrid model of academic publishing. And so they will not pay for these APCs, except if they're part of what they call the transformative agreement. And that's a big part of where we are today with hybrid journals. Um, transformative agreements are um, for journal and publisher that are engaged in the transition to full and immediate open access. And under these agreements, institutional funders agree to finally support hybrid journals as this transition is underway within a defined time frame. And it means that as long as journals accept to uh, actually change in the future and go to actually gold open access at some point in time, the APCs will be taken, will be paid by uh, funders for a certain length of time. This length of time being right now 2024. And But to make a long story short, an important amount of hybrid APCs are still paid by institutions, funders under the time of these agreements. And the way, it, the, the kind of uh, shape it takes, uh, you may be, you may have heard maybe about read and publish agreements. Um, read and publish agreements are agreements that are between, I don't know, institutions and publisher and they allow you to read, but they also pay for some APCs beforehand. So there's a number of articles that are already paid in the term of this agreement. And researcher can actually publish for free, but obviously the university actually paid for, um, for the APC. So now that you heard about APCs and that I told you about this article processing charges, how much do you think that it represents? Um, so there's a question on the WOOC lab. Um, so if you're still connected to the WOOC lab, uh, but so I give you this time period because it actually is a time period for which we have uh, data right now. Um, how much do you think that it represents money wise in US dollars? I say, oh wait, so wait, yes, we're in the world, okay. So I see that you have very different <laughs> um, uh, conception of what it represents. I see a lot of you think that it's a lot of money.
Okay, so I don't know if some of you actually are correct. Yes, 13% are correct. It was, so the number is 1.06 billion uh, dollars. So, and it's a conservative estimate. Uh, but so the idea is that um, it's been estimated that globally authors paid the oligopoly of academic publishers 1.06 billion in publications fees on the 2015-2018 period. Obviously, all the big publishers are not having the same strategies regarding uh, what it actually uh, means for them in terms of uh, access. Uh, for example, Springer Nature has more gold um, journals making more money on gold APCs and Elsevier making more money on hybrid APCs. Um, so meaning that they have less gold journals compared to Springer Nature, which is making the most of its money uh, from gold journals. Um, and in terms of disciplines, uh, the natural sciences are obviously, well, I say obviously because as we've, see, we've seen with the oligopoly of academic publishers, um, they're very dependent on these publishers. And so natural science are what I mean, we represent in this count um, 400, 450 million in APCs, uh, medical and health science. And you see humanities are much less um, impacted by uh, this as they rely less on uh, the oligopoly of academic publishers. Uh, so we're basically in a new serial crisis of, um, in terms of like we have APCs now, and uh, we just had in France a retrospective study on the evolution of the APC costs uh, compared to uh, the subscriptions, and we are now in so in France the APCs represented uh, 30 million euros uh, in 2020 compared to the subscription prices for France that was 90 million. So it's now one third of the, what it costs to have subscriptions is uh, spent on APCs. Uh, so it's, it's, and it's on top of subscriptions. So it's cost now more money actually to publish than it was when we only had subscriptions. Uh, and my uh, institution, pays 250,000 euros in APCs um, in 2021, uh, which is a lot, as you can see, because uh, it's like one, two, three, four, five is the sixth establishment uh, institution in France in terms of APCs. Um, what the future holds? Uh, what are the strategies for sustainable open access? Because um actually a lot of uh, countries are saying well that's not sustainable we're not going to be able to continue paying as many as much apcs and so from my observer and like research librarian point of view two things are currently happening first um the strategies are that greenaway is, re is getting reinforced reinforcement with uh, notably the right retention strategy so we're trying to keep the copyrights to actually make green oa stronger um, because it costs less money and developing diamond open access meaning non-for-profit uh, publishing uh, uh, that is actually so in which the people don't pay to publish but don't pay to read either and less support over time for transformative agreement. And all of this together as, as a goal to decrease APC expenses. And so we have, so we, the Europe, the European, European, uh, European Commission through some institutions and uh, the French uh, funder, uh, National Funder for Research, ANR, they um, created an action plan for Diamond Open Access to actually push further uh, Diamond Open Access, and it's been signed by CNRS, which is the biggest uh, French institution, research institution, uh, Harvard Library, but now we have a lot of institutions all around Europe and the world actually uh, pushing for this uh, Diamond Plan. Uh, the plan S is so um, pushing uh, its number uh, members and actually uh, requiring its member to actually have a right retention strategy uh, in place, meaning that uh, researchers have to keep their rights on their uh, publication when they publish through Creative Commons licenses. Uh, and so this is a pretty complicated issue and 
um, just to show you, I have I found two universities from um, the Circle U Alliance that have a page on this um, right retention strategies because they already adopted it. CNRS in France also, but uh, so websites exist for that. And for example, the Plan S has. Uh, the resources to explain to you how to use this private retention strategy. And I'm saying that because you probably will have to apply these strategies very quickly if you haven't done so already. And the coalition S um, confirms that they will not be supportive of transformative agreements. Uh, so what I told you about the hybrid uh, thing, trying to actually go full open after 2024, because as they actually uh, uh, what as what they saw right now is that um, actually these journals are not transforming <laughs> they just basically take the money and don't transform so that's a problem so they say they will not continue to uh, pay for these um, transformative agreements we so I know it's a lot um, it's pretty it's pretty complicated it's not easy um, but uh, it will help you, I mean, a lot of the things I said actually will help you to understand how we end up with uh, predatory publishing, because predatory publishing does not come from nowhere. It actually comes from this, um, this shift in open access, uh, I mean, in, um, in academic publishing from a reader-based model to an author-based model, because with the generalization of APCs, a new market opened. And basically, a lot of people were thinking, well, if institutions are going to pay for APCs, should we not just create a journal, even if it's not really a serious journal, ask for APCs and institution will pay. And that's pretty much how um, predatory publishing started in terms of the industry. Um, so predatory publishing, um, what, what does it mean? What, what does it entail? So um, there are some definitions and I'm gonna give you one here. It's a publication that prioritizes self-interest at the expense of scholarship and is characterized by false or misleading information, deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency and or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. Uh, I give you a few numbers uh, that we have here. Um, it's more than 1,000 predatory publishers on the Bell's List in 2017. You will learn what the Bell's List is, but this website doesn't exist anymore. It was a blacklist for predatory publishers. It is thought to be, uh, it represents 10,000 predatory journals in 2018, uh, possibly um, for. Uh, um, 420,000 articles in 2014, but these are all numbers and we actually may be around 15,000 predatory journals in 2023 right now. Uh, predatory publishing has main characteristics that, ha, I mean, that are on the spectrum of, um, yeah, of um, fraudulent activities, if you would say. Um, so I'm taking these informations from a book for, uh, that is called Predatory Publishing and is the first um, comprehensive book on the topic. Um, so predatory publishers uh, provide no or only peripheral peer review, contrary to, for example, vanity presses in the past that are kind of like um, self-publishing, but they don't tell you they're going to peer review you. But in the case of predatory publishers, they say they will peer review and they will and then don't. Um, predatory publishers ignore or have lesser editorial services for publications, and they often adopt deceptive tactics to entice submission and compel payments. Um, here are a few examples of pretty easy to spot uh, predatory publishers. It's a kind of a spam email that you may have received. Um, not being very uh, personalized or with a lot of misspellings. Um, you may probably know by now that um, you are not going to be called by a publisher to ask you to publish. Um, so if it happens, it's probably not real. Um, and so these are the kind of emails a lot of people are getting. And have you already received such emails? 
uh, I'm interested in knowing um, whether <laughs> you received that. Yeah. So the options are, oh, yes, or not yet, because you will. <laughs> um, OK, well, 90, more than 90% of the respondents right now say that, yes, they did. OK. So, I mean, still a, a lot of you did, um, which is not surprising, but yeah. Okay. So why, how, how did this happen? Like, how did we end up with predatory publishing? Um, actually, I'm going just to tell you, I mean, things that I'm going to tell you are pretty much the same reasons why, um, the, the, the uh, publishing ecosystem had to change uh, in the late 1980s, 1990s, uh, first a serial crisis. And so APC based called open access increased in the 2000s. And so a lot of funders actually paid for these APCs. So you had pretty much a lot of new avenues for money in academic publishing that just required you to have a computer. And that's pretty much the second reason um, you had the globalization of the internet, of the personal computer, but also, and that's kind of like where the difference goes, I mean, the point that is um, important in the development of predatory publishing is that a lot of uh, Western academic practices known um, among others as publish or perish were important in developing countries that didn't necessarily have the infrastructure or uh, to actually um, um, apply the same rules or in academic country, uh, Western academic countries, and that created the conditions to have uh, 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 predatory publishers. It, it's going to be clear what I mean in a few minutes. Um, so to know if something was, I mean, if a, um, a, a publisher was predatory, until 20, so in the 2010s, you had a website called Scholarly Open Access that was maintained by Jeffrey Bell, um, who was a librarian asset professor in the United States, um, where he actually kept a list um, that was uh, updated depending on a few rules to actually uh, rule if a publisher was predatory or not. And that was called the Bell's List. Uh, the Belsys doesn't exist anymore because, because Bell received a lot of harassment and um, was sued by some publishers that did not like to be included in this uh, list. And currently you have a lot of um, kind of mirror of this list or other blacklist, but you also have whitelist and we will talk about that of publishers that are list are curated and that may that are kind of safe lists of open access publishers. But that was a big moment in um, understanding predatory publishing. Uh, where are predatory publishers? Uh, they are, so here are just the main countries in terms of volume, but it's pretty much not the same, the only countries. Uh, India is the biggest provider of predatory publishers, uh, followed by some other uh, Asian countries and uh, Nigeria. And the authors, um, are kind of the overlap, but not entirely. And that's the biggest ones uh, of the, uh, the entire world is, co is concerned by this. I mean, it's concerned, uh, is part of this. Uh, but uh, Nigeria and China are the biggest provider of predatory authors. Uh, and that's just what I was just saying right before is that you had this import, this import of um, Western, publish and perish incentives that have been driving predatory publishing uh, in non-Western countries. And here are a few examples that are taken from the book, uh, Predatory Publishing. For example, in Indonesia, many universities require their faculty to publish at least 10% of their publication in English. However, less than 5% of Indonesian can write English proficiently. Uh, in China, you have cash rewards 
depending on the words of, uh, of the index journal in, you published in. And you can actually have pretty big incentives. And if you don't have international publication, you may face some layoff. Um, in Nigeria, universities set requirements for the faculty to be promoted to senior level only if they publish a certain amount of uh, article in foreign journals. And for example, the Kazakhstan government set a policy in the 2000s that required all PhD students to publish in journal indexed by Scopus. So all these incentives pretty much drive the need to publish, the need to publish fast, um, to, yeah, to publish sometimes in English as well. And that's how predatory publishing kind of fill, fill a void of journals in which you can publish fast, easily. And that's also pretty much how uh, it became such an industry. Now we're going to talk just a little bit about the risks of publishing in a predatory journal. So obviously, some of you, some of these reasons are obvious to you, but some may not be. So obviously, you can tarnish your reputation and your co-authors are if it's discovered that these journals are predatory because it means that they don't ask for peer review or very uh, little peer review and that's so tarnishing your reputation. The article may very well disappear if the journal does with no record left, especially if the journals don't have, uh, articles don't have a DOI or they don't appear in scientific databases contrary to what they sometimes advertise. Um, it can cause issue related to intellectual property because if you sign off your copyrights to these editors, um, that can be a problem. And even if it's good science, your article may receive no or very few citations because a lot of studies show that um, a pub, um, a, one of the characteristics of also uh, predatory publishers is that they don't receive uh, citations. So uh, regardless of the quality of the work that is actually published in these journals. And it's actually complicated to decide or to, is a journal, is this publisher predatory? Um, the question now also in the pub debate on these issues is maybe all the, all the academic publishers are predatory in some way because they have, um, they take a lot of money, etc. So in some sense, maybe all academic publishing is predatory, but in terms of understanding uh, what kind of practices are implied by predatory um, in the uh, consortium inter-academics um, made this uh, scale of risks that are associated with um, predatory publishers, typical markers, and obviously you will have, and they exist, I will not cite them, but they exist, some publishers that are mainstream, but still fall into this kind of gray zone of we don't know, or it's debated whether or not they are um, predatory publishers. Um, so yes, it's not just black or white, uh, unfortunately, it's a gray zone. And it's not just public uh, journals. So predatory publishing is actually um, that encompasses a lot of different activities. And um, predatory conferences actually exist as well. Um, predatory conferences, so I'll give you a few examples here that you will, uh, be, you will be able to uh, actually consult. Um, but Predatory conferences are basically conferences that happen, but they don't go as a normal conference, uh, meaning that the speakers may not show up. Um, since the play, uh, there would be more emphasis on the partying than the science. So a lot of, or sometimes they just are canceled last minute and you paid for it. So there's a, that there are a lot of different things as well in predatory conferences, but one of the characteristics, for example, is that the, spe the spectrum of um, topics is very, very large. It can be about neuroscience or in COVID-19. So, I mean, a lot of different things that don't necessarily go together. And yeah, I mean, they have shady websites. As you can see, this is are not very professional, but a lot of different hints that you can have on whether or not it's not a real conference. But so this is also something, and it's actually a big industry. Um, and just to give you a few, uh, thought, I mean, a bit of thought for thought, uh, one of the biggest predatory conference organizer in the world is omics. Uh, they're not necessarily doing just things about omics science, they're doing a lot about 
any, anything really. And for example, one of um, their uh, conference is used by, um, I mean, I've been promoted by Philip Morris, the tobacco manufacturer, uh, as a place where they show their work. And um, it's actually interesting to see how, for example, these kind of companies shift from a bogus um, a pub scientific publication to bogus uh, scientific conferences. And Omics admits that around 60% of its revenue come from pharmaceutical company, which is a big uh, issue, and they sponsor the conference. Uh, I'm finishing very fast on other type of predatory publishing that you may not know, but exists. Uh, hijack journals. Uh, so the web domain for a journal is bought by um, a fraudulent activity. And they actually uh, pretend to be a journal that actually exists. And uh, so reroute the APCs to them. Uh, so here you have the example of the Arctic Journal website. And you may think, well, how am I going to even um, full prey of this? Well, because when you type Arctic Journal, the first one that goes up, I mean, the first one in the Google list is actually the hijack one. Um, so, and sometimes they even, um, uh, even the hijack journal is actually um, registered in, in Web of Science or Scopus sometimes. So it's actually making things much more complicated. And the last one is actually kind of like going deeper into the predatory services. Uh, you have predatory indices, so basically fake impact factors. And uh, because impact factor is a brand owned by Clarivet. And so you have fake predatory uh, bibliometric indices. And that are, I say, it's a Russian doll of predatory services because they are used by predatory journals to pretend to have impact factors. So these are predatory activities uh, and their clients are other predatory activities. So it goes really, I mean, it's a whole industry and that's pretty much what I wanted to um, show you and the link with the, um, well, the state of academic publishing in the last 30 years. Uh, how to know is a journal is predatory. You have a few uh, tools for that. For that, Sync, check, submit is an important one. Compass to publish. The white list of directory of open access journals, which is pretty much a safe list of open access journals and articles and criteria on the internet, notably by Bell. And again, uh, a list of list of things you should look at to be sure that the man, I mean, that it's not bogus or it looks suspicious, but same thing as the spectrum, you kind of need to uh, think about it and assess the, the situation. And the solution is rethinking research evaluation. And for example, some countries are actually trying to do something against that. Uh, India withdraw is mandatory research publication before PhD says a submission. Um, and that's a big step because they are, we've seen uh, the biggest um, provider of publisher, uh, predatory publishers. And there's a coalition in Europe uh, that just started to change research assessment and rely less on bibliometric indicators to actually assess research.